The second reading is Psalm 59, verses 1 through 10. Oh my God, deliver me from my enemies. Put me out of reach from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from my evildoers. Save me from my, the bloodthirsty. Look at how they lie in ambush for my life. Powerful people are attacking me, Lord, but not because of any error or sin of mine. They run and take their stand, but not because of any fault of mine. Get up when I cry out to you. Look at what is happening. You are the Lord God of heavenly forces, the God of Israel. Wake up and punish all the nations. Grant no mercy to any wicked traitor. They come back every evening, growling like dogs, prowling around the city. See what they belch out with their mouths. Swords are between their lips. Who can listen to them? But you, Lord, laugh at them. You mock all the nations. I keep looking to you, my strength, because God is my stronghold. My loving God will come to meet me. God will allow me to look down on my enemies. May God had his blessing to the hearing of his word. So we are continuing the David story, and we are also pairing that with stewardship, because we're at a point where David is in crisis. Um, Last week, we're talking, right, remembering the the spears that Saul is throwing, and David ducking, and Jonathan being there, being the help that the Lord provides to have them set up their plans so that David can figure out if he really is safe or not, and Jonathan can figure out if he's really safe or not, and then what to do from there. And then today we come to Michal and what she is doing to help David escape once more. All of these stories are about what people give to make life and to make God's call and God's will possible. And so that is why we are pairing it with scripture or with stewardship. It is the scripture Um, because stewardship is about what we are able to give to make God's call and God's will possible in our own context and in our own chapter, as it were. And so we turn to Michal, Saul's daughter. And um, we're not going to get into um, what Saul thought of women or what other people thought of women um, and being excited about Michal loving David and then Saul being excited about using that to torture David and make problems for him. Um, So come to Bible study if you want to play with that one. (laughs) Um, We'll leave that be in worship. But what we are going to pay attention to is the fact that Michal loved David. And they were married, and when Michal found out that once again Saul was coming to kill David, she took great risk, as Jonathan did, to save him, to lower him out of that window, and to get him to safety. And that's the best part of stewardship, of giving, and what we can do. And so we want to establish a community of love here and to establish a personal faith that is based in love of God, love of self, and love of neighbor. Because when we start from that foundation of love, the risks are possible. Because they are risks that lead to growth and not to breaking us. And so when we have Mike finding this image of a thumbprint, right? That's the sign, the unique imprint of who we all are individually and personally. And so how do we go through life in such a way with one another that deepens and celebrates and supports that unique imprint rather than erasing it and scrubbing it and breaking it? And that is exactly what Michal does for David. From love, she risks so that he might have life and so that the country might have life. And in that risk is a growth that comes and she's able to go outside of her comfort zone because of that love. And she's able to even still be strong when Saul's coming back at her of why did you do this and figure out a way to still stay connected with her father and with the king while yet also providing for David. 
And that's what love does. That's the story of David and Jonathan as well. That's the love that enables us to stay connected to one another even when we disagree with what that other is doing and still support the person being persecuted. It's an ability to do both and. Now again, we can get into the gender dynamics like we already did in Bible study of why Michal had to lie to her dad of, uh, of what David said to her because she made it David's idea, right, instead of her idea. Um, but again, for a different discussion, come to Bible study. And we know that this love gave Michal strength because of what happens next. Um, because there's going to be another bad chapter, um, but because of that bad chapter, we know how good the one before it was. Um, it's a little twisted, but we'll walk through it. Barry um, from Second Samuel. So Abner um, is now in negotiations with David because Saul and his sons, except for one, have died. And so now David is working on coming back to the throne, but Abner still holds power, um, and we've got to figure this out. And so they're in secret negotiations to get, to get this all sorted through. And so David, you know, says to Abner's messengers, who will own the land? Make a covenant with me, and then I'll help bring all Israel to your side. Uh, sorry, that was Abner saying to David. I didn't say that right. Good, David replied. Sounds great. I like all of Israel on my side. So I will make a covenant with you, but on one condition. Don't show yourself in my presence unless you bring Saul's daughter Michal when you come to see me. Then David sent messengers to Saul's son, Ishbosheth. I'm supposed to pronounce that with confidence. It's hard sometimes. Um, and Ishbosheth is Saul's son. And um, Abner is um, in secret negotiations because Abner is supposed to be working for him and on his side to reclaim um, the throne for him in Saul's line. I know it's really confusing. Keep reading. There's a lot. It's castle intrigue. We all watch it all the time in all of the sitcoms. So it's here in the Bible. Okay, so give me my wife, Michal, he demanded. I became engaged to her at the cost of 100 Philistine foreskins. Another story. Again, come to Bible study. <laughs> Ishbosheth then sent for Michal and took her from her husband, Paltiel, Lash's son. Her husband went with her all the way to Bahurim, crying as he followed her. So here's the reason we know that Michal was okay after David, if she helped David escape. She was remarried. That would have happened. She knew that would have happened. But she was able to establish another strong relationship. That love meant that she was not operating in scarcity but abundance. She could love David, she could do right by him, and she could love another husband and do right by him. Now again, we're reading in a lot of love to an institution that wasn't based on love right then, but on political advantages, so I just want to throw that disclaimer in there. But I think it's a fair one because of what Paltiel does. Paltiel weeps all the way, wait, I haven't gone. <laughs> Paltiel weeps all the way with her. When we think weeping, this isn't like, oh my gosh, there's some man tears. Oh, that's adorable, he's sensitive. No, this is weeping and wailing and lamentation style. And that was a woman's role at this time. So this husband was able and was willing to take on a woman's role. Now, that was, if that was because of his personal grief and sadness, if that's because he was pulling a Michal and doing what she did for David to protect her and try to save her from a social injustice of being used once again in the back and forth between David's line and Saul's line. We don't know if it was more personal than social political. We don't know if it was more social political than personal. All we know is that she meant enough to him that he would switch gender roles at that time and go with her until Abner tells him to go home. And then he just can't buck the wagon anymore, and he does. And then Michal is alone um, back with David. And that's where the story then comes in of the dance, of David dancing and celebrating for the Lord. 
and what for him was pure joy and pure prayer and pure celebration did not come across that way to Mikal. And we don't know why. There's a whole dialogue that's in there that's about ready to read. We don't know about enough about that time to know where the points were. We just know that there was tension. We don't know if it's a fair perception or if it's not a fair perception of Mikal's. We don't know if it's more because of her bitterness of being used one too many times. We don't know if there was actually something there that David needed to hear. But she still stepped up to tell him, and that alone. So David went home to bless his household, but Saul's daughter Michal came out to meet him. How did Israel's king honor himself today, she said, by exposing himself in plain view of the female servants of his subjects like any indecent person would? David replied to Michal, I was celebrating before the Lord, who chose me over your father and his entire family, and who appointed me leader over the Lord's people, over Israel, and I will celebrate before the Lord again. I may humiliate myself even more, and I may be humbled in my own eyes, but I will be honored by the female servants you are talking about. This is the part of giving that we want to work to avoid here in our community. This is the kind of giving that demands more than can be given and gets to a point where neither can find the love for each other that they once had, that neither can even find the gratefulness for each other. David's alive because of Michal but yet is throwing in her face how God chose him. Like, she's like, yeah, I know that. I helped you escape so you could follow that call. Hello. And so this is the point where we don't want to get to in terms of our giving. We want it to be from a place of health. We want it to be from a risk that can be done from a surrounding and a situation and context of love. But when we find ourselves in a place where life is demanding more from us than we can give, when those around us are demanding more from us than we can give, then there's something else that we have to step into. Because that's not a space to take risks. Because when we take risks in that space, we will be broken. Our identity, our personhood, our thumbprint will not be celebrated and loved and reinforced and grown. It will be taken and used. And so Mikal's job in this space is to protect herself, is to protect the spiritual fruit that she had grown and developed and freely given, but that now is being taken without any more time for her to grow any of that fruit again, without any more time for her to have a, a root system that can nourish her as well. And so this is the place where she needs to protect herself and find a paltiel. And for those of us who are the paltiels who say we will come in and be there and support and advocate, then we have to do it for the whole distance. When someone finally in this, do you know how hard it is in this squeeze space to be able to articulate what you need to survive? And Mikal does that. And at some point, we know that Paltiel he hears that, right? Because he's still there with her until Abner tells him to go home, until the pushback comes too close for him to stay the course. And so if we do commit to support one another, to help protect each other, then we have to stay the course even when the pushback comes and even when it gets hard. And when we're David in this situation, we have to listen. We have to remember that there are multiple truths in this world and they can all be right. That his moment of pure joy and connection with God and all of the life and the prayer that that dancing gave him and did was exactly the opposite moment for someone else. And if he could just give space for that to me, call, if he could just hear her truth 
and not slap it down and push it aside because his truth was the only truth, there might have been a relationship that could have been started again and could have come back and been knit together. But this one ends. And here's where it gets even trickier. Because I don't know about how you've been taught this story or this interpretation and the ending, but this story ends with Michal's Saul's daughter having no children to the day she died. And until I did study in seminary with my Hebrew Bible professor, Denise, I always thought and assumed that this meant because God closed Michal's womb that this was because she had chastised David and David's faith in the very moment that he was uniting the kingdom and the very moment that he was giving everything of what he had to humiliate himself before the Lord. And because she couldn't step into that level of faith with him, things ended. And they ended from God. But my Hebrew Bible professor challenged me in offering other interpretations for us to read and for other things to understand. There's no divine action expressly stated in this verse. And it's been expressly stated at the very beginning of this story. Barry, this story, David's story, begins with Hannah, the mother of Samuel, and Elkanah, Hannah's wife, that he, uh, Hannah's husband, Elkanah would give only one part of it of the sacrifice to Hannah, though he loved her, because the Lord had kept her from conceiving. And the New Revised Standard Version, because the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had kept Hannah from conceiving, because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival made fun of her mercilessly just to bother her. In the very same story, in the very same book, it is talked about how God closed a woman's womb. In this moment with Michal, that specific reference, that divine action is not stated. And so the question it leaves us to wonder is if that was because God had closed Michal's womb or because David never went and treated her as a wife, and I'm trying to say this judiciously. Um, so was it on God that Michal never conceived, or was it on David? We don't know. But our job as readers is to do what David could not, and to make room for multiple truths to be able to see the both and of life and to be able to be present in it, to be able to hear someone's truth and remember her love that made your life possible, even if things are way messier and more complicated now. But the least David owed me call was gratitude for saving his life. And we don't know if he was able to give her that or not, but there's a pretty big question mark left at the end of this story. And the way that we can honor this ancient present word is to let that question mark sit and to wrestle with what it means for our lives and what it means for how we give and how we ask others to give and how we judge one another in that giving. May we give as Michal did, out of love. May we give as Paltiel gave, out of love. But may we have a little bit more staying power than Paltiel had. And may we give as David could not. May we give in a way that makes room for multiple truths, that gives room for a messiness of life but that what comes through that messiness and through that complication is a value and a gratitude for the gifts that have been given, space and time for healing, right? For the redemption to happen when sin has happened so that new ties and new love can come together again to make new giving possible. 
So as you are considering what you will give for next year to make the ministries of Epworth possible, if you're in that really good place of love, then I want you to consider risking more and giving more. And if you're in a really bad shutdown place, then I want to consider what you need to ask of us, of what you need to make it through this shutdown place in a way that brings life to your soul, in a way that makes it so that you will be in a place again where you can then be again in enough love where you're able to risk more. Here's to the messiness, and here's to the beauty, and here's to the gift of love that love will always and can always bring. Amen.